Hello, I'm Dr. John Iskander. Welcome to CDC Beyond the Data. I'm here today with Dr. Stuart Shapira, Associate Director for Science and Chief Medical Officer of the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Dif Disabilities. Welcome, Dr. Shapira. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. So today's Grand Round session uh, focuses on uh, point-of-care newborn screening. Um, I think many of our in our audience are going to be familiar with traditional uh, dried blood spot newborn screening. Uh, what is point of care screening and what conditions does it test for? Well, John, in contrast to dried blood spot screening where a blood sample is obtained on every newborn and sent to a centralized laboratory for testing, Point of care screening is done at the birthing facility. There's a screening test performed on the newborn at that time. And then the family is alerted if there is an issue so that a diagnostic test can be arranged to determine if the child has the point of care condition. And there are two conditions that are screened through this screening method or paradigm. And they are screening for congenital hearing loss so infants who are deaf or hard of hearing, and then for critical congenital heart disease. So these are severe defects in the structure of the heart that can lead to issues and require very early treatment and intervention. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the non-invasive test methods uh, that are used uh, to screen for uh, hearing loss and congenital heart disease. Sure. The um, testing for hearing loss is achieved through one of two methods where um, responses to sounds are measured in the newborns. Um, and um, for the critical congenital heart disease screening, uh, there are uh, um, probes that are placed on the finger, on the hand, and on the foot of the child. And that test measures the amount of blood that has, it's an indirect measure of the amount of blood that has oxygen in the blood. So for the hearing screening, if the newborn doesn't respond appropriately to the test for hearing, for the sounds that are uh, provided to the newborn, uh, in either one or both ears, uh, that infant is considered as having failed the hearing screening. And for the critical congenital heart disease screening, if there's a difference in the percent of oxygen between that measured in the hand and the foot, or a significant difference, or if there is a low level of oxygen overall, then that infant is considered as having failed the, hear the, the, the heart disease screening. Um, so how close are we to having all newborns in the U.S. covered by these screenings, given that they're, as you say, newer than the dried blood spot screens? So it looks like we're fairly close to 100% for the newborn hearing screening. Um, the hearing screening has been in effect since 2005, so there has been now over a decade of time for hospitals to institute the technology for doing the hearing screening to assure that every baby receives the hearing screening. Uh, critical congenital heart disease screening has only been um, approved since 2011. So most states, but not all, have mandatory statewide newborn screening for critical congenital heart disease. And in those states, I would believe that most hospitals or birthing facilities are doing the screening. Um, so we're getting close to 100% for that screening um, test as well. So um, both for, for the baby and the family and for the rest of us, what are the benefits of detecting hearing loss and congenital heart disease so early? Well, there are benefits first for the baby and the family because to be able to diagnose the condition early allows for early intervention when it comes to hearing loss. 
because children who can't hear don't develop speech appropriately and can't achieve at an appropriate level. So early identification allows for some intervention so that the children can either receive some type of treatment to improve their hearing or um, to allow them to have a non-hearing language development program like a sign language development program early. Um, and this shows, uh, then there's a lot of evidence that shows better outcomes if the ch children um, are identified as having hearing loss by the age of three months and then receive the interventions starting before age six months. Now critical congenital heart disease um, has, um, uh, there's a, a significant risk for death if the children are not identified early. So early identification and getting surgical treatment and management uh, significantly improves the outcomes for these children and decreases substantially uh, the risk of early death. Uh, yes, we, we, I think we saw a couple of things today in one of the presentations. One, a very dramatic example of uh, an infant whose life was saved uh, because they were screened on the first day that their state right. made screening mandatory. Yes. Uh, very, very dramatic example. Um, so we have a screen that's screening for these conditions that's, you know, that's very widely used, you know, has, has benefits uh, to both the individual, uh, you know, and to society. Um, nothing we present in Grand Rounds is ever perfect. So what big picture are some of the, the problems and challenges that we're facing with point of care new, newborn screening right now? So I believe that the main challenges uh, arise from the fact that this screening paradigm is not centralized the way blood spot screening is centralized. So when every baby gets the blood test, a heel prick for the blood spot screening, uh, these blood samples are sent to centralized, generally state laboratories that run the analysis and have centralized follow-up for children who do not pass the test so that families can be located, the children can be referred for diagnostic testing and for follow-up with the appropriate specialists in order to treat and manage their conditions. So this paradigm of, of testing and follow-up is incredibly well developed for blood spot screening and has been that way for, for decades. When it comes to point of care screening, each birthing facility does the screening. Um, there are not well-developed centralized ways to report the data in, or, or to do necessarily to do the follow-up with the children who, are, who do not pass the screen. Uh, it, less so with critical congenital heart disease because if a child doesn't pass the screen for that condition, it's considered an urgent priority that a diagnostic test be performed right away and the child would be referred for an ultrasound examination of the heart to determine is there a structural defect that requires immediate management. Hearing screening, on the other hand, is not confirmed while the child is in the hospital, and the onus is then placed on the family to go to a specialist, an audiologist, a hearing expert, who can do the diagnostic testing and determine does the child truly have deafness or is the, the infant hard of hearing. And then there is the third component of that, and that's to get the child into the appropriate services if they are found to be deaf or hard of hearing. And that, again, is the onus is partly on the family as well as on the, the pediatric or primary care provider to make sure that that next step occurs. So there are a lot of steps that are, occur after hospitalization for hearing loss that um, need outside support in order to be accomplished, which is generally not the case for the traditional blood spot screening, which is very well centrally coordinated. Yeah, so like many multi-part processes that we have in public health, the more parts, the more opportunities to have 
drop out or, or as it's termed in this field, lo loss to follow up. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, we also did hear today, though, about some strategies that are being used uh, in some places to try to address some of some of those problems. Can you just talk briefly about uh, maybe maybe one or two examples of those kinds of strategies? Right. So each state and territory in the U.S. has, um, for hearing loss, has a program that was mentioned today, the EDI program, or the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Program, where EDI has developed electronic means of uh, collecting the screening data and the follow-up data on newborns so that um, there is a, therefore a mechanism to help determine if um, an infant has slipped through the cracks. Um, so the fact that it's, there are now electronic systems um, that most uh, states and territories have implemented uh, allows for more timely tracking for infants that fail. And the EDI um, electronic systems uh, also might have the opportunity for pulling data from medical records through electronic um, data transfers, which can also um, improve the timeliness and therefore um, the potential, I mean, the outcomes, the follow-up and the outcomes for these, for these um, uh, newborns. Um, with critical congenital heart disease, one of the challenges that I didn't mention but was mentioned today in the, in the presentation is that um, uh, the diagnostic testing if a child fails the heart disease screening uh, is an ultrasound or an echocardiogram examination of the heart, which really should be done at a facility that has expertise in doing echocardiography on newborns. Uh, an adult echocardiographer is not going to have the same experience as a pediatric echocardiographer, and an adult cardiologist will probably not have the same experience with interpreting a uh, pediatric echocardiogram the way a pediatric cardiologist would. So there needs to be specific expertise in order to do the testing, uh, which may necessitate the infant being transferred to another facility, as well as interpreting the testing results. Now, some of this might be achievable through telemedicine, uh, when there are, um, r when infants are, are being cared for in rural locations so that they don't have to be transferred hundreds of miles in order to get the diagnostic testing. So these types of interventions for doing the, te the diagnosing of, um, of children who have these heart defects are being implemented in a number of states. So we're, we're coming near to the end of our time, Dr. Shapira, but is there a take home message, particularly for um, healthcare providers who take care of newborns? Oh, absolutely, John. Um, healthcare providers should presume that every infant that they see has undergone screening and they should follow up to determine has the infant truly been screened and what the screening results were. And if the infant did not pass, screening for one of the conditions, whether it be a blood spot screening condition or a point of care screening condition, that appropriate follow-up occurs and that the child is referred to the appropriate specialty provider. And this is critically important for hearing screening since the onus is so much on the family as well as the provider to make sure that the correct follow-up um, either the, including the diagnostic testing for those who fail the screen, as well as the referral for early intervention um, for those who are shown to have uh, hearing loss, that, um, that both of those uh, steps in the process do occur. So the healthcare provider plays a key role in confirming that newborn screening has occurred and that appropriate follow-up is occurring. So again, another example of public health where clinical providers play a, a critical role. Thank you very much, Dr. Shapira. Please join us next month for Beyond the Data.